morning. God is so good. Amen. Great to be back with you. Thank you all for your prayers. Mom is doing much better. Thank you, Eric, for filling in on short notice. Appreciate you guys. She's, she's getting better. Shout out. Hey, Mom. Hope you're watching. You ever have one of those days where you wake up and you're like, oh, dear Gussie. It is all like Donkey Kong playing ping pong in Hong Kong. It is going to be one of those. You know what I'm talking about? I had one of those recently. Not only did I get the phone call that my mom was being rushed into emergency aneurysm surgery, just hours before that I got a call from my dad that his cancer had returned. And then there was a whole bunch of other stuff that I won't even bore you with. So I'm laying down, I'm finally going to sleep. And I'm like, oh, this is, sleep is my, I mean, that's my place. That is my thing. It's one thing I do well. And, and I excel in it, and I'm, I'm just a humble brag. And I'm, I'm laying there, and I'm in my sweet comforter, and I've got the air cranked to like 48 degrees, and I've got my ceiling fan on high, and I've got the comforter around. Even though it's like 100 outside, I'm like freezing inside. I'm like, this is so great. And I'm in that, that mushy state between not quite unconscious, like in a coma or REM sleep, but I'm not awake. Probably about midnight, maybe 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm, I'm sleeping. I'm like, oh, this is in this moment. Lord, all is right with the world in this little six by six bed that I'm in. And I started having this dream. And in this dream, something's tickling my face. I'm like, that's so nice. What a little tickle. And then it moves to my forehead. It tickles me here. And then it starts tickling my cheek. And I'm like, what is that? Stop it. You know, what is that? I'm not a big tickle guy, but it, was, it wasn't terribly unpleasant. It was better than the day I was having, right? And look, I'm in bed, so no complaints. So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, this, this really keeps tickling. <laughs> and as I started to drift away from sleep and slowly creep into consciousness and, and be aware of my surroundings, I would realize I, I'm not asleep. But yet the dream of being tickled on my face has not stopped. And it was in that moment that I went from totally asleep to wide awake because I knew something was crawling on my face. <laughs> yes, Gail, I resemble that. That's how... <laughs> so I did what all of us would do, right? I mean, you don't even think, you don't even have to react. You don't have to tell yourself, get it off. I just slap. <laughs> oh, it hurt so bad. But it was worth it because whatever was tickling me was no longer on this planet. Well, now I had another problem. What do I do? I have to know. I mean, I have to know, right? So I'm stumbling for the light. I'm, I turn it on. And I'm like, what is it? And it's so big. It's so dark. I, don't, I destroyed it. I couldn't even identify it. I was looking at it. I'm like, what is that? Is it poisonous? Is, does it have a brother? Is it, is it right? Let me ask you all a question. Do you think that I just rolled back over and went to bed. <laughs> Not a chance. I tried, but every time I felt the slightest, what is that, what is that, so, get, you know, my leg hairs would move against a sheet and I would think that there's an army of spiders, tarantulas on my toes. It, it just, I didn't sleep a wink the rest of the night. And when I woke up the next day, it showed. Because I looked like I'd been out drinking all night, blood red eyes, and I was not in the greatest of moods. You ever have one of those days where you wake up and everybody can tell it's just gonna be one of those days? It's just gonna be a day that you can I please just go back to bed? Can I please? This is this is a true picture. This is me before I shaved. This is what I felt like. And the day just continued to get that way. You ever have one of those? If so, you're in the right place. You ever have one of those days where you wake up and you think, all right, I'm just going to leave it behind? You're walking to your car, and your neighbor's dog has left a present on the front doorstep again. You get into the car, and you're like, just let me get to McDonald's, Lord, before the apocalypse or something. If I can just get that sweet nectar of the gods coffee in me, I'll be okay. And you're let to drive through, and the 16-year-old the kid who mumbles something to you like, good morning, goes, and he spills it inside your car and down your window and in your lap. And then he looks at you and has the audacity not to apologize, but to go, what? <laughs> it's like he has the personality of a sunburn, and he doesn't understand why you don't necessarily want to give him a tip or a thank you. So you pull off, and you think, there has got to be a black cloud following me today. 
It's like Charlie Brown or Linus or something where there's like this dust following you. If you've ever had one of those days, you are in good company. It happens. You are in a safe place, and you came to the right day to be here to hear God's Word speak. God has a message for every one of us who has gone through a time like that. So open your Bibles to Psalm 103, because we're going to dive in. Pull up your favorite Bible app, Psalm 103. Just hold your place there. Let me welcome our online campus. We have a lot of members who are out of town this week, and they can worship with us. A lot of guests are checking us out for the first time. To you, a special welcome. In fact, I'm going to do something different here. If you are a guest or you're watching online, would you drop us a line? Would you give us a thumbs up or a little emoji or something? Let us know you're here because we are reaching people we don't even know about. And I would love to hear from you. Just this past week, I got an email, and I asked permission to share this. This is what the email said. I shared this with my tech team just to, just to bless them. It says, Pastor Matt, I'm not sure if you will remember me. We only lived in Apex for just under a year. Fast forward about three years and another three moves later, and we are back up in New England. I have been live streaming your services all along, all the way through the highs and the lows of our journey. And I want to thank you for being there each week. I still look forward to the Potter's Hand services. In fact, I've shared your stream with some of my friends and families here in Connecticut. Shout out to Connecticut. You have been a comfort and an inspiration. And I just want to take a time to send you a note to let you know how much I appreciate Potter's Hand. That's pretty cool. That's why we do what we do. So if that's you, let us know. We would love to hear from you. If you can't be here in person, that's the next best thing. We're grateful to have you. Let me set the context of what we're going to read here. Because Psalm 103 is actually a double psalm. In the original Hebrew, it goes straight into Psalm 104. Did you know that? It's one huge mega song. It's a song of praise. Remember, we've looked at songs of lament, sad songs, the blues. Songs of ascent, woohoo, rock and roll, striper. Then we've looked at songs of the messianic nature. Oh, when will the Messiah come? My Redeemer's coming. He's got to come. Surely there's got to be hope and deliverance coming. There's songs of joy and songs of praise. That's this one. And since we know that David wrote it, we can put a date on it. We know it's about 3,000 years old, okay? A 3,000-year-old song, and we're still singing it and talking about it today. So with that as our context, let's read the first five verses of Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, and all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the buzzards. Like the vulture? Like the dodo bird? The eagle. That's the goal. Right off the bat, don't miss this. David reveals his prescription for a better day. Right off, the, just in the first two verses alone, he tells you this. Number one, he says, start your day with God, not yourself. You want to start having a better day? Don't be focused on you. Don't be focused on your problems. Don't be focused on that giant tarantula you smashed on your face at 1 a.m. and you can't sleep. That, that will do you no good. Start your day with God, not yourself. Then in verse 2, he says, start your day with praise, not complaints. Not petitions, not requests, not even your, your, your regrets of what happened the night before. Start your day with praise. And then the third one, probably the most important, start your day by remembering what you've got, not what you've not. Church, this is huge. This seems so simple so rudimentary, but we need a refresher in this. In this psalm, David starts out with a simple command to himself. Don't miss that. The original Hebrew, he's, he's shouting to himself, praise the Lord, my soul. He's not talking to you. He's talking to himself. Soul, I know you had a bad day. I know there's sin all around. I know I've committed adultery. I know I've done all these things with Bathsheba. And I know I've got her husband killed. I know all these, I know my kids are terrors and I'm letting them get away with murder. I know all this stuff, but I am telling you enough. I am taking dominion over it, and I am telling myself, my soul, my core being to my toes, focus on God. Praise the Lord, all my inmost being. That's what that means, from the depths of his toes. Did you catch that? Because when we read through this, we just go, well, Psalm 103, that's nice. No, he is commanding himself to do a simple act. Before his feet hit the ground, I'm going to praise the Lord from the depths of my being, with everything inside. I'm going to make a conscience, intentional decision 
from the depths of my soul to tell God how great he is. Wow. How you doing with that? You want to change your day? That's the first step right there. This is, this is, he uses a word for praise that we're not familiar with. We know the name because we've heard it before. But the Hebrew word he uses for praise here is barak. Barak. Say it with me. Barak. You know what it means? It means to kneel, to bless, or to, I love this, adore. He wakes up, even though he doesn't feel like it, and he is commanding himself, I want you to barak the Lord. Praise him with everything in it. I am going to take my mind and put it under the Lord's dominion. My heart, my aching joints, my upset stomach, all of this, and I'm going to submit it, and I am going to take these negative thoughts captive, and I'm going to intentionally, inten don't miss that, tell the Lord how great he is and bless him. Now, if David didn't feel like doing that, why did he do that? You know why? Because he knew the secret. He knew it. He was so far ahead of his time. This psalm reveals an actual uh, psychological truth about how the brain works. Science would take 2,000 years later to, to validate this. That's how forward thinking he was and how, how much the Bible is so far ahead of man's reasoning. He knew, even if he wasn't aware of it, he knew that the mind has a limiter to it. Did you know that? Your mind has a limiter? Just like some cars have a governor. You know what a governor is? My, my little 18-year-old Nissan truck has a governor, I think. It's stuck. It can't go faster than 38 miles an hour. I was flooring it. I'm like, woo, we're making good time. And then Elias just passed me jogging. And I was thinking, this is, that's like a governor. It stops it from being able to do more than, than you should. And God designed our mind to have a governor, a limiter. It can only focus on one thing at a time. Did you know that? You can only think about one main thought at a time. So if the first thing you wake up thinking about is praising God, then you can't be at the same time thinking about your problems. You'll get twisted up in a pretzel. Your mind will short circuit. I love it when my daughter comes up. She says, Dad, my... My hip hurts. I just, I'm like, let me see your foot. Why? Boom. Did your hip hurt anymore? No, my toe does. Well, see, what's, your mind short circuits. It's hard to focus on two sources of pain at once. Did you know that? Try it sometime. It's kind of weird, but if you want to, you know, boom. Knock your hand with another hammer or something. This is what David is even, he doesn't even know he's aware of it, and he's nailing this truth out of the park. Your mind can only focus on one thing at a time. So my question is, what's it going to be? What is it going to be? If you can only think of one thing, if you're praising God, you can't at the same time be thinking about your problems, the challenges you're going to face, the regrets of the previous day. You can't be thinking about the pain in your knees. You can't be dwelling on the bitterness in your heart or the unforgiveness that somebody's not given to you. You can't be focused on any of those. You want to have a good day? Are you serious? Because this right here is the start. Focus on God, specifically how great he is, because that's what David does. Look at those first five verses. Check, check it out closely. These opening verses, notice what he does. David lists five ways that God has been good to him. He says, he forgives me in verse three. He heals me. He redeems me, verse four. He crowns me. He satisfies me. Now, some of you have done word studies about the names of God. And this is powerful. This is awesome. And I love these because they reveal characteristics of God. David gives us five of them right here in the first five verses. Don't miss that. The very first one, he praises God because he forgives him, because he is Jehovah Salak. What a beautiful name. Think about that. David knew what it was like to need forgiveness. I'd already touched on it. He committed adultery. And if that wasn't bad enough, he had her husband killed to cover up his sin. Man, that's, that's pretty wicked. And then he let his kids run wild and just be crazy. In another psalm, he's talking about how his sin is ever before me, unquote. Ever before me. Everywhere I turn, I see my sin. Everywhere I turn, there's a reminder of my sin. You ever felt like that? Where the weight of your sin is on your shoulders and it is ever before you? David did. He knew all about it. He knew what he was talking about. And then he says something so, so beautiful. Something we all long to hear. He goes on and says, but the Lord forgives all my sins. The Lord forgives. Present tense, active. Don't miss that. Not a one time, hey, forgave you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you sinned since then. You're going to hell. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed your six minutes of salvation. He says he forgives my sin. How many of them? All. Not some. Not just on Sundays. He forgives all my sins. 
And then in 1 John, the New Testament, just so we know it's not an Old Testament thing, the New Testament says one of my favorite verses. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from some of our unrighteousness. All of our unrighteousness. Does that make anyone breathe a sigh of relief or is it just me? That is so powerful. One of my favorite verses. I love it. It's one of the best verses in all of Scripture. He forgives my past. He forgives my present. He forgives my future sins. All of it covered by the blood of the shed perfect lamb. If you have ever felt a huge weight lifted off of you, then you know what David is feeling here. And that's why he can praise God. You ever had a huge weight lifted off of you? Woo! Feels awesome. Let's break this down into the real world. Someone we can identify with. Years ago, I met with my doctor. He said, if you want to preach past 45 years old, you need to be adding some serious weightlifting to your cardio. Keep that blood pressure in check. Keep that cholesterol in check. Pastor Steve before me had a treadmill in his office. I have a weight bench in my office. I don't have to waste time driving to a gym. I can come in early, get in some workout. I can stay late if I want. I can work out during lunch if a lunch cancels on me, and I've got time. One of these things that lowers my cholesterol, keeps my healthy, you know, I've just got more energy. And so one day I was in there, and I'm usually alone, and I'm putting on some weight, and I'm lifting, having a great time. I'm not feeling so good, though. I think I've got, like, the allergies. I've got a sore throat, a little bit of a headache, and I'm thinking, uh, my mind's not on it. But I put some weight on. It was heavy. It wasn't, like, you know, crazy, crazy heavy, but it was heavy. And I'm sitting here. I'm staring at the ceiling, as I usually do, and my mind starts wandering. And I lose track of where I am. And something happened. I stalled. If you ever lift a weight, you know what a stall is? It'll jerk you into reality so fast. <laughs> I was like, dude, 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 dude. uh-oh, uh-oh, oh no, 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 wrong way, wrong way, no, 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 and it started to fall back on me, right towards my, my throat. I was alone. Now, I have several, several options. I could cry and panic and scream, but there was nobody there. I could bail, which is, you only do that once and you'll never do it again. And that's because you're lifting heavy. You don't put collars on your weights, right? You're not a little girly. You, you sit there and you tilt it and those plates start sliding off. And once they get light, the other side, ding, <laughs> like that. And it shoots the bar across. And I mean, something's going to get broken. Your drywall, your arm, something's going to give. So I didn't want to do that. The other option is to drop it to your chest and slowly roll it down your body. But if it's a lot of weight, it starts cracking ribs. And once it gets off your rib cage, whoom, it goes into your liver. And I got about that far, and I was like, oh, this is going to be bad. So I, I reversed it, <laughs> and I start rolling it back up, and I got sweat pouring off me. I'm like, oh, this is so foolish. I can't believe I did this. I, what was I thinking? I had such a weight on my chest, and I said, Lord, just this one time, <laughs> dear sweet baby Lord Jesus, six pounds, seven ounce in the manger, would you please give me the strength, even though I feel horrible to get this off my chest, because my wife will never let me live this down. <laughs> Which is why I didn't tell you until right now, you can't do anything about it. <laughs> and, and I push, I push, man, I got veins popping. I didn't hit me that heavy. And I'm just, and I get up on that thing. Oh, I can't tell you the relief I felt to have that weight off my chest. But that is nothing compared to the weight of my sin being removed from me. David knew that. The weight of a sin gone, as we'll see later, it's from as far as the east is from the west. Never to be remembered again. Buried in the sea of forgetfulness. Y'all, that is great news. That is incredible. And David knew that. So he woke up and he said, I'm not trying to sound churchy or cheesy or over spiritual. I'm going to praise the Lord because he forgives my sins. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Then he goes on, and he gives a second reason why he praises God. It's because he heals him. He is Jehovah Rapha. What a beautiful name. I love this. Here, here's, here's what I want us to notice. When does God heal you? All the time. He's doing it right now. In fact, we're going to do an experiment. Everybody, hold out either arm. Just put it out in front of you, okay? Not optional. Everybody, got this? Good. Take your other hand and put it on the other arm, like this. Okay, now do this three times. <laughs> this is so gross. You know what you just did? You just deposited over 100,000 dead skin cells on the person in front of you. <laughs> you can look at your neighbor and say, thank you. <laughs> Think about that. You know why? Because science has taught us that we are constantly being healed. Every seven years, every cell in our body 
is completely restored and replaced with a new one every seven years. God is constantly healing us. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe about that, go home. If you're brave, get your vacuum cleaner out with your little hose, and put a white handkerchief in front of it, and go vacuum your mattress. In 30 seconds, it will be covered with skin cells that you have sloughed off in your sleep. And that's nasty. <laughs> but it's so, God is healing you even in your sleep. How amazing is that? He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the one. David is praising him. He is the great physician. A third reason David gives of why he thanks God is because he is Jehovah Gaal. He redeems me. You know what to redeem means? That's so beautiful. It means to buy me back. Do you know what it's like to be bought back? The Bible says that's exactly what Jesus did. He paid a huge price for us. The Lord who redeems. He gave the highest, most ultimate price. Little Johnny, my favorite story. I love this story was trapped inside because it was pouring down rain. So his, apparently his parents thought he could handle a knife, and they gave him a little knife and a block of wood, and he started whittling away. He kept looking out and hearing the thunder and the rain and seeing it pouring down. All he wanted to do was just get outside and play. Before long, he had actually made a rough shape of a boat, a little wooden boat, very crudely hollowed out in the middle, very blocky. And he just started doing it, and he got lost in this. After three hours, he stopped, and he realized, it's not raining. It's not raining. And without even asking, he bolted out the door, ran outside. At the end of his road by the curb, water was pouring down from all the rain that had just come. And he couldn't wait to set his boat down, and he did. And the boat took off, and little Johnny just started walking. He was beaming with pride. Look at that. I made that. And he's having a great time. He's looking at the boat, and then it starts picking up pace. So Johnny does. And the next thing he knows, this thing's hauling. So he's running as fast as he can, and he's trying to keep up. And all of a sudden, he sees it turn a corner, and it goes down the storm drain. And he knows where it empties. It empties into the pond. And as he races over the hill and he looks, he sees that it's too far out. And he's not allowed to go into that dirty pond. And he knows it's lost forever. Fast forward two days. Johnny's on his bike, riding to the end of the cul-de-sac to old man Lowenstein's house. Old man Lowenstein's having a yard sale. There's a bunch of people up there. They're looking through the clothes. They're looking through the little knickknacks and the tchotchkes and the whatnots and the doodads. People go through, and he sees toys. He goes to the back table, and he's looking through it, and sure enough, you know where this is going. He finds his wooden boat. How is this possible? And there's no price tag on it. So he turns, he says, Mr. Lowenstein, Mr. Lowenstein, this is my boat. Sure it is, son. <laughs> you don't understand. I made this. This is my boat. Sure it is. Can I buy it? What, where's the price that I own? He says, how much do you have? Well, I wasn't planning on doing it. I've got a dollar seven. It's absolutely all I have. Then that's what it'll cost. Everything you've got. Without hesitation, he gives them everything. Johnny grabs the boat and he turns away. And just before he's out of earshot, Mr. Lowenstein hears the weirdest sentence. He looks at the boat and he says, little boat... Did you know you are twice mine? He steps closer. He says, you are twice mine. You see, I made you. But then I lost you. But I paid the price, everything I have, and I bought you back. That boat had been redeemed. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. He bought us back. He is Jehovah Gaul, the Lord who redeems. Jehovah, that's who he is. Gaul, that's what he does. So David wakes up and he says, you want to have a better day? Right off the bat, praise the Lord. Start your day this way. You're on your way to a better day. But it doesn't stop there. He gives a fourth reason why God is so good. It's because God encircles him. He is Jehovah Atar. Not Atari. Atari's cool, but this is Jehovah Atar, the God who encircles. Your translation probably says, he crowns me. Do you see the connection? What is a crown? It's a circle, right? He encircles me. He crowns me with his love. God encircles us with his loving kindness. If you went to that community unity service that we did in, uh, I think, January, February, we joined together with Bridgepoint across the street. I got to preach the message on God's love. And I use the Greek word agape. Most of us are familiar with that. It's God's holy, pure, unending love. The Hebrews don't use that word. They use the Hebrew word hesed. You know what hesed means? Hesed is beautiful. Hesed is God's unfailing love. And over in Psalm 136, we see, give thanks to the Lord for his 
love endures forever. It is unfailing. His hesed, his loving kindness. Our English language is so weak to compare God's love. We have to use two words. Did you know that? Loving and kindness to get loving kindness. Just to come up with hesed. He crowns me. He encircles me with his loving kindness. I picture a dad grabbing his toddler. Oh, man, she's asleep. I want to grab her so bad. Mercy's asleep right here. I won't wake her. I have a picture of her. We'll do this instead. Here she, she's doing this new thing, y'all. It is so adorable. When I walk into the room, she yells out, Daddy! And she runs in her little clumsy way, and she grabs my leg, and she squeezes it for all she's worth. Y'all, it melts my heart every single time. I could walk upstairs, shave, turn around, come downstairs. She sees me again like it's the first time. Daddy! And she just hugs me. I love it. And it melts me. And I think, how does God, our Heavenly Father, how much more does He love us? Oh, are you awake? Are you awake? Hi, baby. Hi, come here. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> mm, I love you. You having a good day? We're not doing anything. We're just chilling, just hanging out in the middle of church. Having a good time? Okay, can I put you back? I woke you when I told a story about you. I love you. That's, how does God feel? When we turn our attention to him, we praise him. You ever think about that? He encircles us with his love. And the fifth reason that David gives for praising God is because he satisfies. He is Jehovah Sabah, the God who satisfies. This is so good. This is, nothing satisfies like God. You can try to fill that God-shaped hole with all kinds of stuff. I have, I've tried. Your car, your job, your kids. You could try to fill it with money, with a Bama game, a striper concert, fishing, soccer. You could try to fill it with all kinds of stuff. But you know it doesn't satisfy like the Lord. If you guys have been here or with me early on, then you remember when we first started this church, we had a, a, a guitarist, the guy on the left here, Clay White. Just his face makes me smile because Clay is just such a cool, funny, he has a razor sharp wit. Y'all recognize this guy right here? Recognize this guy right here when he had hair? Oh, who's that in the middle? Clay is a fan of a certain band, the Rolling Stones. I don't know anything about the Rolling Stones. I'm a fan of Striper. Clay cannot stand Striper. And if you've been friends with us on social media, you know we go back and forth about who's the greatest band of all time. Now, apparently there's some lead singer of the Rolling Stones. Anybody know his name? Mick Jagger, right? He's known for his outlandish face and all his moves and stuff. I don't know anything about the Rolling Stones. But I'll tell you this. Clay can't stand Striper, and he began to dog me and my band, my favorite band, because no real band would ever wear yellow and black like that. No real band would have to use a gimmick and dress in such outlandish colors. If they were a real band, if that was a real lead singer, he would just have his talent be the thing that carried him through. Your band is a bunch of posers. I mean, he was brutal. He was like slicing me up. I'm like bleeding. I'm like, Clay, you're so mean. Said, Your band is, call me when you find a real band, because the Rolling Stones are the real band. And Mick Jagger wouldn't be caught. Can I tell you the joy when I Googled Mick Jagger and found him wearing that. <laughs> I couldn't send it to him fast enough. I don't think it resonated quite with him like it did to me because all he sent back was this right here. It was just kind of one of those things where I, I knew I'd probably crossed a line. I don't know much about the Stones or his favorite band, but I do know this. They have one big hit that I had heard of. And it's something like, I can't get no... Sad, right? But I try, and I try, and I try, and I try. I can't get no, right? You know what I'm talking about. I don't even know what the song's about, but I know this. Clay, if you're watching, I would tell your hero, satisfaction, real satisfaction is found in Jesus. It's found in one place alone. You can't get no satisfaction. You know why? Because we're trying to replace God with shallower things with false imitations, with little 
baubles and trinkets and shiny things. Look over here. Be distracted. Don't give your attention to the high and holy one, your maker. Don't live out your purpose with passion and joy. Be bogged down in the daily grind. We're going to talk about that next week. Be bogged down in the daily, daily, I'm going to get up, I'm going to punch my clock, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to come home exhausted, cook dinner, go to bed. There's got to be something more to life. Yeah, there is. You're meant for more than that. Your satisfaction will never be found in anything except Jesus. He is Jehovah Sabah. He is the one who satisfies. He is the one who quenches our desires. Don't forget the secret. It is impossible for our human minds to think two thoughts at the same time. And by that same token, you can't feel two feelings at the same time. So here's where the plane lands. When you wake up and you thank God and you are thankful, you cannot at the same time be feeling bitter and angry or depressed or hateful. When you are grateful and you are thankful and you are... The, Make no mistake, David was having a bad season. Notice what he did. He said, enough, soul. Enough of the constant I hear in my head when I lay down, all the noise and the... Stop it. I am taking dominion over it, and I am going to intentionally start naming characteristics of God and bless his name and tell him why he's so good and just run down, you satisfy, you heal you sustain. You fed me today. You made the cells in my arms function normally today. They didn't pop apart. I didn't explode in a big gob of goo. And there's all, you could go down the line and be doing all kinds. It is immeasurable how incredible God is, even if David didn't feel like it. Now, is it easy to think about something other than yourself? No. Do you have to teach a baby to cry for its way? No. Do you have to teach a baby to be selfish? Even sweet little mercy, even perfect little mercy hope, just this morning, stole my hash browns from McDonald's. <laughs> True story. It's not in my notes. True story. I said, right? Oh, well, Dad had an issue. I, 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 I need that hash brown. That's fuel to preach. It's a, it's a biblical thing, right? I mean, I, I can, I've got to have energy to do this. And I go, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm, I'm going to be that dad that takes food from his kid. No, I'm not. You can have that, sweet. We're going to work on no later, though, because that's not, we're not doing that again. I didn't have to teach her how to steal my hash brown, right? You don't have to teach a baby to cry for its bottom or for its way. It's inherent in us. We are selfish. And David is saying, you have got to take dominion over your mind, over your feelings, and command yourself to praise God, think about him, and focus on him first thing. Remember all that God has given you. Remember what you've got, not what you've not. Those first five verses are such a formula. He forgives, he heals, he redeems, he encircles, he satisfies. And then in verse 11 and 12, one of my all-time favorite verses, he says this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Let that sink in. Bask in that truth. How awesome is that? Your sin thrown as far as the east is from the west. Maybe you're not happy about it. Maybe you got no sin. But I do. And that thrills me. And that gives me hope. And that makes me think, God, you are good. It's one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture. No matter how far, how long, how wide your sin is, God forgives those who ask him for forgiveness. And then there's another step. And it's not preached about much in the American pulpit anymore. But we're not going to shy away from it. It's another word called repent. And it's not popular. And it's not politically correct anymore to say, oh, how dare you judge me? Huh? Who are you to say? I'm well, God's word says none are righteous except from Jesus. And we need to repent. Maybe you're hearing that for the first time. Maybe you're listening online. Repentance is this. It's agreeing with God on the hideousness of our sin. It's not debating it. It's not saying, well, God, I know you defined this, you know, for 6,000 years this way. But, you know, we're, we're modern and we've changed the definition of things. So now we believe, we know better, Lord. No, it's agreeing with God on his incredible holy standard and saying, I get it. I've made a mess of my life, and I, in this moment, invite you to forgive me, and I am going to walk 180 degrees away from my sin. Be my Savior. Redeem me like that little boy with the boat. That's what it's about. David knows this, and then he ends. This is so beautiful. He ends the psalm in verse 20 and 22. He says, praise the Lord. 
all his heavenly hosts, angels, all you servants who do his will, you who minister. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere, his whole dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And it's over. Because he knows everyone, everything, everywhere ought to praise the Lord because he is good. And when you wake up and you feel like that cloud is coming, you say, not today, Satan. My God is good. And then you list things that you're grateful for. Because when you focus on that, you can't be focused on the other. Your mind can focus on one thing. So here's your practical application. Here's your challenge for the week. Start your day with God. Start it with praise. When your feet hit the ground, start, find two, three, four things that you can praise God with and focus right away on him. Then start listing things that you're blessed by. Remember what you've got, not what you've not. Dwell on that. Lay that at his feet and say, Lord, I commend you. You have dominion over me. I submit to you. You are good, and it will give you a fighting chance at having a day better than the one you were having. In fact, let's try it right now. Would you pray? Bow with me. God, we give you our lives. We submit to you. You are good, even when we don't feel it. You are good, even when we get diagnosis of cancer or have aneurysms. Lord, you are good. Nothing changes that. This fallen world is passing away, and we look forward to the day when you make all things new, the new heavens and the new earth. You give us joy that will last us through the dark days. And God, we claim that. Thank you for the power of your word. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, and it gives us strength and nourishment, and it cuts us when we need it. Lord, we give you permission in this moment to make us more like Jesus. We want to be like you. Lord, we want to hear, well done, faithful servant, at the end of this day. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Continue to speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen.